Wake that ass up early in the morning. The Breakfast Club. Morning, everybody. It's DJ MV Angela Yee, Charlemagne the Guy. We are the Breakfast Club. <laughs> we got a whole legend in the building. A whole yes. legend. A whole legend. Raphael Sadiq. What's up? What's up, my brother? What's good, bro? How are you, sir? Man, I'm excellent. New album out? After eight years. It's no, not out I, yet. it comes out August 23rd. Mm-hmm. Okay. Single came single. out a couple weeks ago. <laughs> what made you want to put out an album after eight years? I got a studio. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so. You were doing other stuff in that studio. You was writing, yeah, producing. Yeah, yeah, you know, I, I, I love music, bro. And it's, you know, after a while, you and you work for other people, and then, you, you know, people keep asking you, are you doing another record, or... And I keep saying, yeah, it's almost done. And it's never almost done. And then one day I just got tired of saying, it's almost done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I said, you know, let me put out a record. Who did you work with on this album? Or did you do everything yourself? I did a lot of it myself, but I worked with Brooke Delu. Um, He's from um, uh, Jay Davey mm-hmm. back in the day. Um, Daniel Watts did like a little spoken word piece. He was in Hamilton and uh, <clears throat> this Nat King Cole piece. He's a dope artist. Uh Mostly it was me, man. It's just me playing everything and singing and just... Well, what inspires singing. you now? Does music inspire you now? Man, I love traveling. You know what I'm saying? Oh, that's so when, rich man talk there. That's when you just got money just to go around the world and see it. Nah, not really. My tour taking me there. You okay. know? So if you do a record, you get to go out and, you know, play yeah. for these different Forever. countries, taste some yeah. great food. You, you know, get paid to work. You get you paid get to, to work. And you could just go to a city like, you know, I'm going to play today and then I'm going to take... My dream is to go somewhere. I want to play a certain place. I go play one day and I vacation for three days. Right. That makes sense. That's my retirement, uh, Raphael. So what do you enjoy? What places do you enjoy <clears throat> to go to? What are some of your favorite places? I like the Caribbean. I could just mm, leave and never, I just leave and never come back. But, you know, I, I love playing in like, um, I love playing in Paris. Paris is probably the biggest market for me. Um, I like Amsterdam because it's a nice place to be. Um, uh-huh. You smoke a lot. <laughs> I must play. I don't really smoke there a lot. No, not he said not there. No. Why? Because it's illegal, so it's not as fun? It's too much um, tobacco. They just keep putting, you know, I'm not that dude. You know. So Jimmy Lee is the name of the album. Jimmy Lee is the name of the record. It's about my brother. Mm-hmm. My brother uh, <clears throat> was like my one of my my best friend, actually. He was, mm-hmm. we, uh, I was sort of like the mistake child, my mother said. My dad said. The mistake Jesus child? Jesus Christ. Yeah, my dad, my dad and mom was real hard. It was like, my, my dad always told me, boy, <laughs> you know. Very blunt. My dad always told me, boy, we were smiling and said, though, you know you was a mistake, right? <laughs> You was a, a great mistake. mistake That's a good mistake. Yeah. I gave your mom a three hundred dollars to to go get rid of you, and then she went to Safeway and spent the money. That's a true story. Did he really yeah. say that? Yeah. That's true. It's true. Oh, Damn it, man. You know, how, you know how different the world would be without <laughs> Damn you, man. Oh, I'm being honest. Like at least even just for, just for, for those of us who listen to music. That's, wow. a, that's wow. a hurtful thing Yo, to say, sad, though. No, man. no, my my dad is like the funniest straight that's dude. Crazy. Are you still world. cool with him? He's passed away two years ago, mm-hmm. almost two years ago. And never made you feel away though? No, like, he could smile. You've seen my dad smile. He, <laughs> I don't give a shit. Why would he tell you that? <laughs> like, there's he no reason told, to tell you just, that. He, he, already, he already had eight and kids. You know, I was like, even Dwayne, my brother, and Tony's, he's from another mother. We don't have to say mother. Mm-hmm. But he didn't write anniversary? Nah, he wrote, good. he wrote whatever you want. Oh, okay, yeah. okay. Well, He's a beast. Dwayne's a beast. Dwayne's a beast. He was my teacher. You know, he right. was like my Michael Jordan growing up. So, mm-hmm. like, wow. I, I'm I, in it because of him. He, he sort of taught me how to play instruments. Mm-hmm. He's one of the guys. But ho- I was taught by a neighborhood full of just uh, like thugs. Our, our neighborhood has a number of thugs. But like y'all had MCs in New York on every borough and corner. Mm-hmm. We had bass players, guitar players. They were sometime playing music and sometime they were doing other things. We get to, you got open, your Crip right? flag on right now. Yes, 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 Crip Crip. <laughs> no, see, for real? Nah, I'm an East Oakland boy. We don't do that. Oh, okay, okay. What gotcha, do you think gotcha. about Oakland now when you go back? It's the same to me. I mean, of course, uh, of course, you know, gentrification is attacking every market, but um, the soul of Oakland is always going to be there. You know what I mean? It's, mm-hmm. uh, when I grew up, it was... It was all black. I went to all black school. Then the Samoans moved in a little bit. And then now it's still like maybe Latino and Samoans. Not that many black people in my neighborhood. When I go there, I don't know anybody. But other than that, I think Oakland is like still full of slap. You know, they still believe in they slap. They We credit a lot of different type of music. But I don't think they get the props they, they should get. But I'm, I, I love the band. Oh, yeah. A lot of hip-hop artists, especially like a few years ago, was all on Oakland Wave. Yeah, yeah, everything yeah. Everything was sounding like Oakland. Yeah, everything. Even mustard sound was Oakland. Yeah, it was a little. I think they had a little beef about that or something yeah, like that yeah, one yeah. time. But Oakland has been that, you know, too short. You know, I grew up with in the same neighborhood as Todd. Y'all call him too short. I call him <laughs> Todd. But mm-hmm. uh, I have, yeah. I, oh. Now somebody, I was told that this new album is inspired by your brother's journey of struggling with yeah. addiction. My brother was a heroin addict. Had a key sort of like since I knew my mother was from you know from Louisiana. 
they came to uh to the they went to Chicago and then they uh, half of my family was in Chicago and the rest are in the in the Bay. But yeah, my brother was on heroin as soon as he got from Louisiana came from Louisiana and, and made it to uh, Oakland. So he, he was struggling. He actually OD'd in a um in a garage. My other brother, uh, between me and Dwayne, I think he, he might have been like nineteen, I was seventeen. <clears throat> he murdered himself. He shot himself in the head in my dad's house because he couldn't quit and we had a pretty prideful type of family you know so i call them the black kennedys because they just thought they was better than everybody else sometimes but it wasn't <laughs> wasn't really like that mm -hmm. but i just think he felt bad and he just took himself out and then um so mother, four of your brothers passed right Tragic. three and one sister wow and you know so a lot of a lot of drug abuse i've seen a lot you know um and i just it just dawned on me this dude would like you know drop me off like you know, like pit bulls and you know, put it in my backyard, I wake up, I got a pit bull, and then, you know, I'm like, oh, man, cool, I got a dog. And, but he's like, everybody, you know, when you when you become a smoker in a hood, you have a different name. You could be a respectful man, but then they start, you know, you'd be like, what's up, Smokies? Yeah, Junkie J. Yeah, you know, like, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. so I didn't, I never looked down on my brother like that. So he was always in my life. He was uh, in and out of prison. Mm -hmm. um, and you never, you never dibbled and dabbled the drugs at all? No, nah, I didn't ever smoke a joint until I was 32. Really? Yeah, no, I like that lunch money, man. I was I had to have my French fries. And what, what, was, it, <laughs> was it because you saw the effects of it on other people? Yeah, and when yeah, you see yeah, your yeah. sister coming to the house saying she's going to get a loaf of bread at 12 o'clock at night and we got like four loaves of bread on top of the refrigerator, you, you know was, right. something's calling you. You know like drugs is a very addictive thing. And my dad was always the type of person like, if you see a gun, somebody shooting a gun, and then you see this person go down, this person go down, and then here you come, what you going to do? And at the time, I don't think I even knew the how to define rapid, but I was like, I better, I better get it right. Mm -hmm. I was like, yeah, I'm just gonna turn around and go the other way. He, that's what I'm talking about. You know, he so he knew he's seen it so much. Mm -hmm. My dad was a boxer too, so he was. Uh, I was just I seen so many examples that I just didn't want to be a part of it. So why did your brother specifically inspire this, this record? Because yeah. um, I was making records. I made this song called So Ready, and it's about a guy that's uh, the whole neighborhood loves him, but he goes off, he binges, and he comes back. A, you know, four days later, and everybody loves him. His wife stands behind him no matter what, and I and I saw this character, and it reminded, reminded me of my brother, who was just who people look down on him, but I just always revered him as this, mm -hmm. you know, my brother. He in prison, you know, you your brother in prison when you're a kid, you think he's a celebrity till you go there and he can't come home with you. Mm. You know, you're like, oh, you're not a celebrity, you're in jail. Mm -hmm. But I always looked up to him because he would send me these uh, these wood sculptures he would do in prison. So, and when I I just thought about, it, I would love to have. All of my brothers and sisters sitting like at some bar, have happy hour, drinking a beer, and, and just talking. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, damn, I don't really have that. Damn. You know, he can't really, um, he can't really watch this. And his son, and my uncle took care of his son. He played him. He played football and basketball in Virginia. And then he came to the Bay, and then we took care of him. So I took care of his son, helped him out. You know, put his son in a good school so he could play basketball. Of course, he didn't want to go to that school. It was like Jesuit. He was like, I don't want to go there. No, ain't no girls. And I'm like, bro, the girls are across the street to other school. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but anyway, that's JJ. His his son is like one of my, one of my, I call him my best friend because, you know, I had to like watch him from a kid. He lost his mom and his father Damn. to the same thing. So just, I just started calling Jimmy Lee so the family could look at it and say, you know what? Out of all the people he picked, Jimmy Lee, because that's who I looked up to. Mm -hmm. and, it, and I know everybody has a Jimmy Lee in their life, so right. now it's just hashtag Jimmy Lee. The first single is uh, it's called Something Keeps Calling. And it's, I'm, I'm talking about, you know, like, uh, it's a lot of young artists who dying from the same thing. But, you know, I watched it firsthand. Right. Yeah. So this album was therapeutic you could, for you. I'm sorry. Did you ever think that you could do anything to help them or try to? Because I know it's hard on you, too, when you're trying to help somebody and it's like you're... My brother didn't want help. <clears throat> he just wanted money. Mm -hmm. My brother would tell me one day, he was funny. He came. He would always, you know, whenever your your somebody in your family's on drugs, there's always a guy to come in the car, and, and your, my brother was always the passenger. Either he needed to get the carburetor fixed, he hadn't had a license ever in his life, or he saved some lady. She gave him a car, and then the biggest one was like one day I said, I uh, come back in about thirty minutes, and I'll give you the money. And he said. He started crying. That was weird. Never seen that before. And I'm like, "Well, what's wrong?" He's like, "The doctor said, you know, he gave me a, a week or a week or two to live." But yeah, he was uh, he had AIDS, right? From needles. Your brother. My brother, okay. Jimmy. And he said, um, "The doctor gave me a week to live." Mm -hmm. And I just looked at him like, "Wow, you would take it that far?" He lived about 
14, 15 years after that. <laughs> yeah, my brother just wanted money. He was funny. We all know him like that, dude. He was crying. I already knew it was like, Stop really? You, I just said I'm going to the bank in five minutes and I'll be right back. He, he was a he funny wait. Yeah, but but guy. but you know, giving him money, that was kind of like helping him in a way, right? So that had to be uh, a was, struggle, right? The, the rehab was. If he met you, if he if he was living and he saw me talking to you right now, if he ran into you somewhere, you was in Oakland, he'd be like, Charlamagne of God, you know my brother, right? Hey, let me hold $20, he'll get back to you. <laughs> <laughs> That's Jimmy Lee. Everybody loved him. So the song I wrote, So Ready, I wrote it. Uh, this couple in Brooklyn was dancing to a song I have called, on Instant Vintage, called uh, Sky Can You Feel Me? So they were dancing to this song, and I was like, I'm going to write a song about these people dancing. and It's called So Ready, and it's about the lady just hanging with her man. Almost like, I don't know Samuel Jackson's story, mm -hmm. you know, verbatim, but I heard he had some issues when he was younger, mm -hmm. and his wife stood by him. Yeah. My record is more forgiving the person that accidentally stepped into a chemical that they didn't know they was going to take over the rest of their life. Mm -hmm. So I'm not knocking anybody that has any addiction. We all have all have addictions. What you are your addictions? Yeah, we had him up here. He said that. He said he was had a real, what was it, crack, I think, back in the day? Yeah, crack. Something yeah, he was on bad, and he said his wife held him down the whole time. Yeah, yeah. so. Yeah. What are your addictions, since you say everybody has addictions? Hmm. I mean, one I don't like, I'm sure, you know, it's definitely chocolate. <laughs> chocolate? <laughs> Me too. Like, actually, I mean, what's worse is actually here. chocolate croissants, which is worse, because that's just the bread and butter, bread, yeah, butter, and I can eat, like, three of those in the morning. Just for no reason, with uh, some coffee. That's like not that. a terrible addiction. I don't have a bad one. Mm -hmm. I, just, I don't have a bad addiction. I have a normal addiction that every guy might have. Women? But nah, that's not an addiction. That's just, I'm a Wiggins. That's my dad. That's just, <laughs> 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 that, that's just no, nah, that, I don't have that. Addiction. They always say that men who don't smoke or drink a lot, their addiction is usually women. Well, I think I do both, so I don't think mine okay, is so, that. Okay. <laughs> but smoking. it's also different coming from a family where you saw addiction I saw ruin it. it. Like, I saw it. Most of the young people in the family learn from that. I'm like, y'all, they won't touch no drugs or alcohol. Yeah, I just, um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not big on it. You know, all you, you're always trying to please. I'm just always trying to please the neighborhood too. You know, please my mom and her friends. I didn't like my mom. You know, I hear my mother on the phone sometimes talking about some other ladies. Uh, family but you know how they go to church and they testify and they go ladies stand up and say I'm going to the church to pray for me you know it's my son's on drugs my husband in prison mm -hmm. and everybody be hey man praise the Lord and the lady sit down and everybody tell these stories but then my mother get home and I can hear her on the phone talking about the lady and then like you know <laughs> oh, and, and I just walk up to her and look like mom how you going like and she point the finger <laughs> and I'm like so you know I just never wanted to be the kid that you know somebody have, and you seeing Sister Nelson's badass kid? Right. He bad as shit. I didn't really want that to be a part of my life. So I always really wanted to, like, you know, have my father just kind of, and my mother go, like, you know, Ray never really gave me any problems. Now, the group Tony, Tony, Tony. Yeah, yeah. None of y'all are named Tony. None of us. So how did y'all get the name of the group? Um, Dwayne. Um, Dwayne used to put this uh, perm in his hair called a Curly Kid. It's a relaxer, mm -hmm. and he already had really, like, fine hair. Dwayne was a pretty boy in the band, always had, like, you know, always had a lot of women around him. Oh, he a party guy. So he used to slick his hair down, part it, have it coming this way. When everybody had, like, these jerry curls, he didn't. He was just, like, like a Billy D type. Pretty Tony. Mm -hmm. Pretty Tony. So he, Dwayne said if he would go to school on the first day, his name is Dwayne, but his teacher would call him Tony. And he, his hair was so, so done that they would say, like, three times, like, he was Italian, like, Tony, Tony, Tony. That's how we came up with the name. <laughs> That's how you came up with the name? 100%. So it was a joke. He was, we were laughing about it, and then we played at a wedding reception. Because in the beginning, we weren't like an R&B band. We were like trying to, be, trying to be the police, the black police. But, you know, the black industry, like, the hell with that. We don't want that. And so we was playing at this wedding reception. And we didn't have a name. It was a man, our manager and his brother turned around like, what's the name of the group? And we didn't have a name of the group. And we just laughed and said, Tony, Tony, Tony. And it didn't, then when he said, ladies and gentlemen, Tony, 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 we looked at it like, that's it. Whatever that is sounded right. And mm -hmm. uh, that was in, probably in Inglewood. Did y'all know that y'all was making such timeless music? Well, um, Charlemagne, we, we just we just knew classic people. We we was, grew up listening to Earth, Wind and Fire. We we the Isley brothers, we loved them like, you know, mm -hmm. like you guys love Eric B and Rock Kim. That's how we saw that's how I saw like, you know, Phil Bailey and, and 
the Delphonics and the Stylistics. And, so and that was the bar. That was the bar. The bar yeah. was really high. We really shouldn't even be in the business, um, unquote, to who we really love. I mean, we never made That's the Way of the World. That's my goal, to make a song like that. Mm-hmm. See, that's I, tough to say, though, because for our generation, close, bro. yeah, saying. anniversary is yeah. that. Anniversary, Whatever you want is yeah, that. Feels, feels good. Just me and you. Just me and you is that. Like, I I it's mean, you you saying that, that, but it, that, that's in the same vein to me. No, no, like, it's definitely in the same vein, but I'm glad my bar is that high. I'm glad I think I haven't done it. Mm-hmm. You know wow. what I mean? Someone said, just me and you, you were on tour with New Edition. Yeah. And that song, you actually were talking about New Edition. No, I'm just, no, I'm actually, I wasn't. On, I'm a huge New Edition fan, but mm-hmm. what do you mean? New what do you mean talking about New Edition? Don't worry about. She's talking about just me and you. When I say don't worry about, you know, don't worry about Ricky. Don't oh yeah, worry yeah, about yeah, yeah, yeah. Bobby, They said that actually. They yeah. said they thought that was a diss when they was here. No, it wasn't a diss. Yeah, it was. No, no. they thought it was. No, they, no, it was. Uh, it was just. Maybe I'm, I'm making that up. You yeah, are. Yeah. I don't remember that. <laughs> but they, you can easily think that. But what happened was, I'm just sometimes a lazy lyric. Lick writer and I just they, I knew all their names. It was in front of you. <laughs> I just Robbie, said Robbie, Robbie, all right. I yeah, it said their name and whoever caught on to it, you know, no additional. I'm I'm a huge fan of you mm-hmm. know the NA. But like the, the Tonys was uh the Tonys, Lucy Pearl, all those groups were just uh me trying to if I ever ran into Maurice White or anybody, I would want them just like, you know, like if I was a hooper or something, mm-hmm. I would want, you know, if I was Steph Curry, I would want Jordan to see me and go like Y'all are dope. Like I that's all I really wanted. Who, who, who gave that to you, though? Who was the person that you got that from and you was like, man, I might be on to something? In the beginning, it was, well, once we started making records, it was definitely Earth, Wind & Fire. Um, um, definitely Prince. You know, I played with Prince when I was like 19 years old. So that's my first ever, you know, gig on the road. And um, That's a great first gig on the road. Absolutely. Yeah, right out of high school. Um it's just amazing that these beautiful songs. Elton John. Elton John. Oh, word, word. You know what I mean? Mick Jagger. You know, just people you play with that play with people that you love. Like, I like, I love Mick Jagger, but I also love Holland Wolf. And that's that's how they got started because of, you know, Muddy Waters, you mm-hmm. know. So they play with I would love to be talking to Muddy Waters and Holland Wolf, but they're, they're gone. So when I talk to Mick Jagger, I'll say, so tell me a story about Holland Wolf. That's what I want to know because that's where I know where it came from for you. So you said this album was therapeutic, right, for you? Yes. So what was that other music you was making back in there? Because you've been had the pain. You've been seeing yeah. your struggles. So was it all? Was the music always an outlet for you? Yeah, I think I was, I, I guess I was running from all of, like, you know, my sister, all the death when my sister was a, she got, this guy, this kid was um <clears throat> chasing, um running from the cops. And he, my sister was talking to my mom on the phone, and, and my sister was the smartest girl in, in our family, you know, graduated on a ton of property, just doing it, and she could sing. She could sing blues, so one day she's talking to my mom, my mom get off the phone, and she gets in the car. She's about to roll out the driveway, cops chase a kid, boom, gives her permanent brain damage. Yeah. We have to pull her off the machine, <clears throat> and I'm in the studio singing It Never Ran to Southern California. Wow. Right? Mm. So I came back and watched my mom and my dad just, they're just shaking, we in the, mo- in, uh, in, uh, in the hospital, and she's in the chapel. So they pull in the plug, I go talk to my mom. I can't. She's. Just, I can't even really talk. I leave and go back, and finish recording the vocals to so whenever I ran in Southern California. So, I guess it was therapy. I just start looking at music like that's why when I when I hear all these beefs with people like rap groups and everybody and everybody being all hard. I'm like, I was singing the most beautiful love songs, that's and amazing. all this stuff would happen to me, but I wouldn't be out like you know. My mama died. My mama. I'm like, bro, that ain't nobody's. <laughs> like, yo, you could still be you through all this, you know, mm-hmm. tragic. I mean, my first funeral was my 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 sister boyfriend killed my brother when I was seven. Mm-hmm. And the first funeral I ever went to, uh, you know, they called my name and, and I had to get in this limousine. I hated limousines forever. When we made it, I just never, they said, you want a limousine or a van? I'll be like, van! Mm-hmm. You know, because you're seven years old and you only seen your brother for a certain amount of years. And my, my brother was a, uh, was a straight up gangster, though. you know, top pad quarter length black black burner 67 cougar just a straight you know thug but just a singer a showman my brother sang country music mm. so he would be in the hood but then he would go across the bridge and go watch charlie pride sing that makes a lot of sense though because people don't realize the dope ass stories that are in country music 
So you probably got that storytelling ability yeah. from listening to that, maybe. Yeah, listening to my, my dad. My dad sing a little bit. But everybody, my whole neighborhood just sang, you know. So I just, I just in the end, I just had to, like, uh, I've been making records for myself, honestly. I never made records to sound like anybody else. Because if I thought I would sound like Stevie Wonder, I don't. He sings too good. But if you get close, somebody might start singing with you. But my whole thing was I just wanted to... Uh, be better and just and just make record. I want my records to outlive me. You ever try to they outdo will. yourself? Like outdo those those classic records, or do you just say, you know what, I'm just gonna make records because with the amount of hits that you have and the amount of records that you can still play right now in the club that people still dance yeah. to and still love, do you out, ever try to outdo that? Yeah, sometimes. The way I do, it, I call myself a point guard, right? Because I know when to dish the ball. So like, if I if I really want to pass it up. Maybe I could, you know, pass the ball to D'Angelo and then do Lady and Untitled for him, and then he could take it a little bit further. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So that's how that's what I like to do. I like to work with other artists. Oh, that, Solange, you did Cranes in the Sky, yeah. right? That's a phenomenal mm -hmm. song. Erica yeah. Badu. Yeah, and that's a different route. You know, mm -hmm. you can let I love Solange that. go around this way, and that songs that you know, Cranes in the Sky is just sitting in my love of my life. Was sitting in my the music was just sitting around for eight years. I did that like eight okay, years. Okay, you're showing off now. <laughs> now you just showing. How did she hear that though? Because it was sitting there eight years. So it was one of those things. Like I got something eight years ago that I did. Yeah, she like... she came by and I pulled the song out for her to write to it for me. I had already sang a different melody it was similar to that one, and I gave it to her and she um, she said I'm gonna write to it. I hadn't heard from her in like two three years whatever. She called back and said, Can I? Can I get get it without the vocal on it? I didn't really. I didn't even I I couldn't even find it the files I couldn't find the files and um a friend of mine had a copy of it but it was just an instrumental so what she has is just off of a, a CD it was on a CD a CD that's wow. a CD so it's no no way to separate it she just sang over the top of it so when you make something from the heart like mm -hmm. I said I've been making music for myself I never made music to be like I want to get this radio station this that. I just followed those those blockers, those Maurice White's Babyface and Jimmy Tent Jam and all these people, and I just sort of let them block. And when I see a hole, I run through it. You gotta have that. Are you a music hoarder? Meaning, do you nah, record a bunch of songs and just nah, hold on to it? I, I give it away. I re, I record a lot of beats. I, I a lot of I love making just beats. I'm a huge Dilla fan, Tribe fan. I love New York hip hop. Like to it's because it's so soulful with so mm -hmm. many different samples that I grew up. Like the meters and the you know, so I, I just I miss that now though that tribe sound, the yeah. Sound. You miss that type of music now. Yeah, I mean, I think you know, I think right now, I don't to answer your question. I don't hoard music. I just I just play it. I, I live at the studio. I try to get out now because some of my friends from from the Bay, from Oakland, my boy Willie Hannon, somebody asked him said, uh, "How is he now? How is Ray? Is he, how's he different from school?" And he was like, "Hmm." He the same. We just don't ever leave the studio. Mm -hmm. And when I heard him say that, I was like, I don't. And then I start. I, I leave a little bit more now. I don't stay in the studio all day. I Where like, do you go? Do you go to the club? Do you go out? Do you go to a bar? Do you go? To if I was in New York, maybe the old New York, I'd probably go to the clubs. I don't like the clubs in L.A. I live in L.A., but I'm not from there. I, if I'm in Oakland, I'll go out to some bars. You know, I'm, I'm more like a bar. Lodge. Yeah, I don't even know what clubs happen in New York yeah. anymore. Did you Did you really start with Prince? No, I started with the. I started as a kid, you know, playing just everywhere, you know, with church groups, gospel groups, the Hawkins family, the gospel hummingbirds, and quartet groups that sound like the Blind Boys mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Like, uh, nah, I didn't. It's Prince was. A, I, I did. I auditioned for Sheila E. Ooh, I Sheila love Sheila E. Sheila e. e. Okay, yeah. how old were you then? I was nineteen. I just graduated. I auditioned for her. Played a drum, Sheila E. Grandma. And Sheila's a beast. It. And Sheila and Prince was. I auditioned for Sheila, then I. I made the band and I took two of my buddies. I went back home in my neighborhood and grabbed two of my friends. And we, what's the other guy was uh, Tim, the other Tony, the drummer. I went to high school with him. Mm -hmm. And we left and we went on tour. And then we used to play with Prince like clubs. And he he was just really supportive of uh, of Oakland musicians, period. Prince was. Yeah, he was. Yeah. Were you hesitant to go solo? Because after leaving Tony, 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 and then you started Lucy Pearl and. Was it like, and you did, of course you did your solo stuff, but was it something that you wanted to do? Or were you like, I'd rather be in a group? I'm a band guy. I like bands. Mm -hmm. uh, I, that's why when I left the Tonys, I immediately called, you know, Shahid, from, you know, Ali Shahid, and then I grabbed Don. It's just yeah. fun. Mm -hmm. It's just, to me, it's funner being in a band. But mm -hmm. after that didn't work, 
Why didn't that work? It's like three years. Like Lucy Pearl Lucy was your partner yeah. something else too, though, right? No, just... Uh, just Lucy Pearl and Tony Tony Tony? And then Tony, yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, why didn't Lucy Pearl work? Well, Don was sort of... Uh, <laughs> yeah. Sort of what, a diva? Well, that's what they call themselves, but... I mean, she, she, she wasn't involved and she wanted to do a solo act. She wanted to be a solo act. She left them to do a solo act and then we sort of came along and said, can we use you for a minute? And then she sort of lend us her talent. But then she said, now it's time for me to go solo. But it was like six months into like, I want to dance tonight. Mm-hmm. That was quick. That was quick. And things was popping. It was popping. Mm-hmm. Have you forgiven her for that? Yes, I've I've grown up to be a great <laughs> adult. And you know, I, 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 I forgive everybody these Why'd days, you call man. Cindy, then? Nah, you can't. I'm, I'm not into that. Like, you know, I, I want it to be what it was all the time, mm-hmm. you know? So. I heard that you guys can't do Tony, Tony, Tony because someone else owns the name. My brother owns the name, Dwayne. That's no, that's not why we didn't do it. I just, I just didn't want to, I didn't want to be looked at like a temptation, like I can only do one thing. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So I was I, like. I, and nobody looks at you like that. Oh, no, you don't now. Mm-hmm. Because I, because I, I just said, I felt like it was more I had to do. Yeah. You know, um, as an artist, I so it was so much building in me, and I, I was learning myself at the same time that I can make records that people actually, actually listen to me sing. Because I didn't want to be a singer; I was a, a bass player. I didn't mm-hmm. want to. I I'd never wanted to be a front guy and sing. But once I started writing and producing, um, I just felt like I needed to go out and grow a little bit, work with some different people, <clears throat> and we just grew differently. Me, and my brother, I love my brother to death. No, mis- no, no, it's just, it's just for real, like. Uh, we had we had issues a little bit, but we we got a little bit of money. When you get a little bit of money, people just mm-hmm. have different friends. You have your set of five friends. I have my set of two, and and, and other people. You know, people get married. Tim got married, and then you know people have different ideas. And I, my whole thing was, at the time, I wasn't smart enough to like be able to corral them together and say like, look, man, let's let's stay together, and let's make this records. I know y'all think that I'm. I'm the singer. I can go solo any day, and I didn't know how to do that. So I just—that's what they believed. So I just—I just went home, and after we did this VH1 show, um, live show, some VH1 rock show, I just came home and sat my suitcase down on the piano, and I just never called nobody back ever again. But see, I, I think that they probably Damn. knew that was gonna happen eventually, and they probably was dreading that day. So it's like you did it and just confirmed all of their suspicions and anxiety to begin with. Yeah, no, but it, I had a lot of reasons. You know, like I said, we all grew different. The money got funny. The executives got weird. And, you know, people were telling me, I'm going to kill you and put a horse head in your bed. It, just, it, it got Who really said weird. That to you? Ed Eckstein. Ed Eckstein? Yeah, he was the president of Polygram at the time. Oh, my He's gonna God. He's going to kill you and put a horse head in your bed? Yeah, he was. I, but we're friends Why? now. We're friends. We're friends yeah, now. yeah we're now. friends. He, I think he just watched a couple mafia movies and he didn't know I was from the, away. He didn't know I was from the East Bay. And I was like, boy, is you serious? You better tell me you serious or not. I called him laughing on his machine. I said, if you serious now, let me know. But why, though? Why did he want to do that to you? I think because he felt like... He's breaking the group up. He thought I was going to break... I was never, I never wanted to leave. Never. Mm-hmm. Never, ever. That put that on my eyes. I never wanted to leave. Um, but they started, you know... They actually... Actually called Stokely from Men Condition and asked him to be the new lead singer to Tony. What? Who did that, Ed? Ed did... He also took the guitar player that we had, who was a friend of mine who I put in the group just to play. He called him and it, it told the other guys, won't you just take him and and then call Mitt Stokely. Stokely called me and said, bro, what's going on, bro? I was like, bro, whatever going on, what, whatever's going on with your situation and, and Mint, trust me, it can't be. It can't be nowhere near as bad as this. And that was that, so that just never happened. What would make him think that he could just remove you and plug somebody else in and the, the public was going to be accepting of that? Man, I have the slightest mm-hmm. idea, but I, like I said, um, I don't know. I guess he didn't know my talent, because maybe I didn't either at the time. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, I never second-guessed myself. I just always felt like when you get in a record industry, like when you get in a business that you, that you guys are in, you, you probably only think about excelling, right? Mm-hmm. When I got into business, I only thought about excelling, meeting different people, um, playing around the world. Once I got a taste, I was going to be doing something. You know, I mean, I used to work at a record store, and I thought if you work at the record store, somebody famous was going to walk in and, and grab you. You know, so my imaginary mind and how I, how I see things is uh, 
Like when I put out a record, I, I know I'm gonna be playing it for at least a thousand people at some point. Mm -hmm. If I don't feel like that, that record doesn't come out. Now, right. anniversary and just me and you. What was the mind frame? Of where, what were you thinking when you wrote those records? Who was the lady that had you so <laughs> open? I was thinking. I don't know, man. I, I'm. I don't know who's that. I didn't even. I wasn't writing about. A, a, a person. Just impossible. You don't yeah, write a yeah, song like anniversary without having yeah, somebody have a view. <laughs> I don't believe you. I refuse to believe you. No, that. not at that time. It had time. to be somebody like no. Russia, somebody you wanted. It just sounded good. Y'all always wanted something. <laughs> but something. Like, like I said, I have a vivid imagination, so I can look at anybody's situation. It's almost like a freestyle, you know, like, like an MC. You mm -hmm. can just know everybody's situation. Mm -hmm. Just me and you, John Singleton came to me and said, For what a justice? No. That, just me and you. Mm hmm. Boys in the Hood. Boys in the oh, Hood, yeah. bro. Yeah. He came to me and said, uh, there's a Neil Long and this kid are going to be in the locker room making out. I need a song for it. He, I never saw the clip. He just told me what it was. And then I wrote Just Me and You. So that was my first solo. You just disrespect Cuba Gooden? Well, I guess he deserves it right now. Cuba, yeah. <laughs> my bad. My bad, Cuba. No, no, no. Be along in this kid. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm speaking how John, that's what John said. John called, John called him just a kid. Damn. He was just a kid at the time. At the right, time. Well, we, we got yeah. it, we got Damn. it. We got no, it. now he's... Damn, Trey. Yeah. He said he deserves it right now. No, no, he got yeah, it. So, yeah, so I, I wrote this song at my mom's house in, in, um, in, my, in this room, and I forgot the hook to the song just me and you so i changed it all and this girl came over to, and said i let her hear the song she heard it back then she said what happened you you changed it i said i forgot it and she sang me the hook that's how i remembered it and so when i put the record out ed Eckstein told john singleton that it couldn't say Raphael wiggins my name was wiggins at the time and i said why not he just said it has to say tony 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 so that was my first solo record mm. Then he didn't ask of you. Ed said the same thing. And I told and I said I changed my name to Sadiq at that time. And um Wow. I that, told I told John that um I couldn't you couldn't put it in a movie if it doesn't say Raphael Sadiq. And he called Ed, he called Business Affairs and said, Hey, this this record is gonna say Raphael Sadiq. So that's how my name really got out was How'd you from, get Sadiq? You Mr. Just... John Singleton. Well, I wanted sort of my own name because me and my brother we sort of had the same name in the production. People would get us confused, and I didn't want people to get confused. So I was like, I like how Tupac's name was Tupac Shakur, and he was from the Bay, and I was like, that's it pops off. And so I started looking at, at names, and Sadiq means man of his word. Mm -hmm. I like what it meant. And it was like Raphael's open, and then Sadiq closes, Raphael Sadiq. And I just grabbed it, went to the courthouse, bloop. And then that was it. Yeah, I like that. Raphael Wiggins sound like the dude who sell mid, but you don't want to go buy. That's right. Might rob Actually, you. I got to give Ed Eckstein some credit because he's the one who told everybody who wants to hear Raphael Wiggins record. <laughs> <laughs> and so I rather hear Raphael. So today. somebody told me that he said that, he was, and and you know what they told me? I was kind of feeling like I was just a little bit, but I was like, shit, he might he's have right. a point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, perfect. And so when I did a record, I just said Raphael Sadiq. But I called my dad and said, hey, I want to change my name. You know. what told you, well, you wasn't supposed to be here anyway. <laughs> yeah, you wasn't supposed to be here anyway. I didn't give it no so thought. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm watching Ninja Turtles. And I, <laughs> and I, <laughs> now, did, um, damn, I forgot. Oh, did y'all make money? Yeah. Or did y'all have a new edition? No, 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 no. Well, our first situation, no, we didn't make money. No, mm -hmm. we were driving all our homies' cars, you know. Um, no, we didn't have we didn't have money. No. Not in the beginning, not the first album, the, the second album. First album had what feels so, feels good. Yeah. On no, it. no, 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 no. The album? first album had Little Walter on it. That was it. Hey, <laughs> Little Walter. There you go. Hey, there you go. Little there you go. Walter. Yeah, oh, there dude. you go. Wow. That was the first single. Wow. So I'm, my records have always been talking about somebody getting murdered. You know what I mean? Yeah. So like I've always been talking about it. Like if you if you sell dope in my neighborhood. So Little Walter know. was a real person. Yeah, my whole neighborhood. You yeah. gonna somebody's gonna smoke you. It's been on my mind. Since the beginning, I just, I say the things in, you know, increments. I but that's mean, so crazy you said that, you know, that's what we miss. As a kid, my mom would play your music in the house so much when she's cleaning on yeah. Sundays mm -hmm. on the weekends. We don't have that type of music now. Would you play, what, what are you playing now, Charlamagne, in the house? Hey, Lil' Walter, feels so good. <laughs> you still I play, do, I, I love 90s R&B. You, you still playing Raphael? I'm going, like, when I go on, vac I'm going on vacation SWV? tomorrow, no, they, everybody around me know he don't hit number 90s R&B. That's wow. it. Yeah, it's a, it, it was a good time. I mean, we toured with with everybody. I remember touring with Kwame, mm. 
the polka candy dots, man rhythm. yeah everybody candy, uh nwa actually the nwa the movie when they got in houston when they were at, at the dome we were there we, we were on that show same show in detroit when they got kicked out we were on that same show damn that's and, crazy and i said hang out with cube when, on those tours i hang out with cube a lot mm -hmm. and then cube i remember cube told me one time for real, he says he's like yeah man i don't know how long i'm gonna do this bro i think i'm gonna I'm gonna, I'm gonna get in the movies. He told he me that. You gotta put it out there. Way before, and I was like, when I started seeing him, and when I fought, when I saw him in Boys in the Hood, I was like, dude, sat, just sat and told me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna make movies. You do scores and stuff now too, bro. Yeah, I scored. I did Insecure. Yeah. I did um, Underground. Um, God, I, I've been I've doing it. Yeah, you know, I tell people all the time that "Lay Your Head on My Pillow" is about eating pussy. Lay your head yeah, it is. Yeah, you're see? right. Thank you. See, I play. I like to play that and song while well, you know. Well, it just sound good. I don't know if it was really about that. It was really for me. That's what it sounds. It was like. really for me listening to Al Green going, "Lay your head on my pillow." I just I take from the greats. Mm -hmm. You know, they say if you want to be great, you take from the greats. You don't deal with the amateurs. So I just always look at the greats. Why'd you get eating pussy out of that record? Yeah, yeah, yeah why'd you say, fly? Somebody he say, hold on. <laughs> he say, lay your head on my pillow and just relax. This gift is... This bed is yeah. made for you. Yeah, this bed is made for you. So well, if I she's you laying... Her bed. If she's just laying... <laughs> Fresh sheets. <laughs> <laughs> if she's just laying on the pillow and she's just relaxing, what's he doing? Somebody told you. Taking a nap next to her, nigga, we fall. Nope. Yeah, yeah. No, no. no I just, uh, I, we was just writing songs that, that um, we felt that would be impactful. And because we also wanted, you know, we wanted a lot of girl fans, but we felt like the, we always felt like the nine to five dude never really had, never had records made for them. You know, mm. even about my album Jimmy Lee, I feel like it's a record that, you know, Marvin made records or Al Green that you could be like, you champion Al Green. Now guys don't really champion too many artists because. Mm -hmm. They showing off all the jewels and everything, and cats don't. They, you don't want your wife to be looking at that dude or revere that person that way. So I felt like Jimmy Lee is that record that everybody can relate to, whether, whether you're a kid. I always tell kids, you know, anyway, if, if you if you're not paying rent at your crib, you're probably gonna learn my music because your parents is gonna play it. Would you let somebody sample your music or do it a record over? Yeah, they do it all the time. Yeah, like do a, a full record. And the reason I ask is before I let go, Frankie Beverly and Maze. Yeah, they did it over. But Frankie Beverly and Maze is gonna be a tough one now because now the new version is Beyonce now. Now well, that ain't true. That ain't true. That ain't true. Yes, it is. Don't when tell that lie. When you go to lie. the clubs now, don't tell that lie. When you go to cookouts now, don't tell I'm that DJing them. They, they said they happy that, that, that song the has the Beyonce life. version. You, you might don't be. Don't tell that lie. You might. You might. You might have a little something on it, but that's almost like saying I respect to be, but that's like saying is Kevin Durant coming to New York? We don't know. You don't know until that happens. I don't think it's gonna happen. Johnny Gill <laughs> performed at the BT Awards Sunday, closed out with Frankie Beverly version of Before I Let Go. I was in a, at a dinner party Friday. <laughs> they played Frankie Beverly and Maze, then they played Beyonce's version. So they ain't know. That's a, that's too classic a record. Beyonce version they playing in the clubs. The is, Beehive is, is the gonna new support generation though. Is is just taking it over. <laughs> I like Beyonce's record, but I, I don't like when they come on in the club because when Frankie Beverly come on in the club, you know it's time to go home. But when they play Beyonce right it's after, it's time you, to dance. Now I gotta fake have fun for another thirty minutes before I sneak up. <laughs> oh, that's why right. you know, you know, legs hurt, knees hurt. <laughs> now who's this Ed guy, and why was he such an evil person to you? He was the president of uh, Polygram Records. And how'd y'all get cool after him threatening what? to kill you and all kind of stuff? You he... man, I just sort of like you know, man. I think the biggest thing for me in life was to forgive. It's a lot of people that was in my life that's not in my life. I say it's almost like when you play, you know. Little league, you know, basketball and junior high and high school and college. Those kids you play with, you can't take everybody with you. You know what I mean? And so I just learned everybody's not supposed supposed to be in my life, and and I learned how to forgive, man. It was it was a hard thing, you know. But um, Ed, uh, I saw him one day at a music store. He was with his son, and um, he introduced me to his son, but he couldn't tell his son, you know, I, I threatened this kid, putting the horse head in his bed. That's why he don't speak to me. And his son is a is a is Probably gonna be a great musician. So when I saw his son, I had my nephews with me. They're great musicians too. And I just said, "What's up to him?" And I just said, introduced myself to his son, and we talked. And I said, "Man, bring your son by and to play with my nephews. They both wow. be musicians. Come hang out in my studio." They came and hang out, and then um, then he said, "Cool." Next time he came back, he came back by himself. And then we talked, and I said, "Bro, I didn't really mean anything. Like you know, when I was telling you, I wanted to know about publishing. I wanted to learn. I just came to you as a brother to say like." Hey, drop some, drop some, some dimes on me. I'm asking questions. It's okay that you own 50% of my publishing. No, it's not. No, because I got it back. But oh. I'm saying, 
that's what I had to pay to get in. That's what it is. But give me a little bit of information. Then I was I was asking too many questions. Mm. And then one time he wanted me to smoke. He wanted you know offered me some you know way back. And I wasn't smoking. But so now I invite him back to my spot. And then I light up the joint and I said, now I smoke. Now we can smoke because I want to smoke, not because you offered it. Right. You know what I mean? So there's some things I wanted to say, but he's cool. And we, we talk every once in a while. He comes by the studio and hang out. And just, How'd you get your publishing back? I just can make kill him and you put, put, a you horse in to put a horse head in his back. <laughs> no, no, he, he his company it, it it left and went to Universal, and then after that, you know, you just keep writing songs, and you could just actually buy it back yeah, by okay. not taking cash and taking, uh, you know, more your not taking advances. Right, exactly. So how'd you end up making money back in the day then? Because I mean, back then that's when everybody was getting got. Oh, how did y'all escape that? We got got, but it wasn't a lot to take then. We were still growing. You know, I was lucky. Lucky, lucky it happened then. You know, yeah, to be you somebody like to get got early on in your career, so you know for later. Yeah, no, I just um, I'm not a big spender, man. So I don't need a lot of money to live. You know what I mean? I want a lot, a lot of money, but I don't need it to spend. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm, I'm pretty. I'm not cheap. You know, but I, I don't even have any kids, so you know, I could spend like fifteen thousand dollars on myself for the, on clothes, like whenever I want to. You ain't got no kids, no responsibilities outside. Yeah, of I could buy the Macintosh turntable because you know if they said you got kids, you shouldn't go down that rabbit hole. It's just yeah. too much. So I'm not. I'm, I was never like, you know, really trying to show out or go home to my friends and look like I got more than them. And I still wanted to just walk around and be normal and go to still restaurants. Ray. And that's that's right, still Ray. I wanted to go around and. <laughs> Did that help or hurt though? It helped me. I love my life. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> I love it. You see, you ain't got nothing really bad to talk about with me on the radio. Now, we got some stuff. You want to get into yeah, it? Yeah, let's now? get to I'm it. Gonna, I'm just with you. <laughs> like, I got some But I, I love your show, though, man. It's like, I just, I, I'm always trying to, like, I don't know what I haven't done yet, but I'm always trying to re rememberize your intro. Oh, you what up, y'all? It's DJ MV. MV. Yeah, I'm always, like, choking on it. I'm like, damn, I'm going to That basic ass shit. <laughs> you, can't, you can't even hey, remember bro, the hook to his I songs. can't even remember. You can't remember the hook to no, his songs. I'm a damn hook to my songs, bro. Something. You don't ever feel bad for the other Tonys, though? Because they can't, you can't go perform the real those records. not Tonys, but go ahead. They can't. Well, they tour. They've been touring for, the, the band's been going strong since, 90, I left in 97. Right, mm -hmm. they still going to the They've been touring for, the, the the lead singer that was in the group was in there longer than I was. But anyway, no. Don't nobody remember his voice. No disrespect to him. But people don't, they don't, that signature voice with Tony, Tony, Tony belongs to you. Oh, yeah, he was a nobody, for sure. Oh, Damn my it, God. Man. But I'm saying when, I'm saying <laughs> when it. <laughs> he was a nobody. Oh I mean, yeah, come, fancy, yancy, on love. <laughs> but yeah, I'm saying when it comes to me, I mean, some radio personality said, one time they said, this rec this radio personality told me on radio that he went to see the Tonys and he was so, to his surprise, um, he didn't miss me. Really? That's disrespectful. He said it, he said that, it a few times. That person not on radio what? anymore, is he? Yeah, he's still on the radio. Really? Who was it? Uh, I don't want to say his name. This definitely wasn't an opening. Tom Joyner. Okay. What? We said, retiring this year. Yeah, he said it like like Why a, a would lot. Why would he say that? He he's he a, a he, he no no I don't think so no, I think he's he was Tony's fan he just loves the music yeah. mm -hmm. he be on that yak too now he said yeah okay he said <laughs> <laughs> he said it about like three times on the radio I'm on the phone like damn is he like I thought he was kind of going on me too so I just said well Tom the reason why you didn't miss me because I I wrote all of it you're never gonna miss me I'm always there that's a good stab that's a good comeback. now let's be clear did he yeah. do this were they performing in his boat cruise <laughs> I'm sure they have that's been. That's probably why. That's probably why you were shitting on you, because you, you didn't come. Mm -hmm. That's right. Like, I ain't miss you. We had a good time. But, like, my brothers, uh, like, with Dwayne and Tim, we um, we are, I mean, me, me and Dwayne are just, we're, we're close. Like, I can call him in the middle of the night and be, bro, I just I just drove into Oakland. <laughs> Where you at? I'm like, I'm downtown. He jumps in the car and just comes out, smoke one, and just sit on the, we just sit on the sidewalk, walk and talk. We've done that, like, what, two weeks ago? Uh, Tim, I see him all the time. He comes by the studio. So, I think, after this record, we are going to put out something like a, uh, or we're just going to play somewhere. Maybe like a, I think it's going to be an instrumental album first. Something like Cool in the Game would do when they made Summer Madness. Mm -hmm. I just think mm -hmm. that would be a great a great introduction to us and just like, you know, we're family. And mm -hmm. the, the most part, I really want to do it for, not just for records, just for, uh, so our, our family can see like, you know, us hanging out. Because we hang all the time. You know, we just we just grew differently, and we understand we was we was boys, we was full young, you know, dropping in this, from rolling. But I was. I, what, what's the importance of the other two? Because I think people see them and okay, yeah. think that it's there's no importance. What's the importance of them? Okay, I'll, I'll tell you about each one. Okay, Timothy Riley is a was a childhood prodigy, like 
church B3 organ player. He plays drums in the Tonys. But he's a little... Tim, you're going to hate me for this, but it's, mm. it's true. Tim, a little lazy, but he's the most talented one in the group. Mm. He wrote It Never Ends in Southern California. Wow. He put the music on a cassette tape, took off with some girl, dropped it off to the room, and I played it, and it was... The whole it thing. Never it, rains in shut up. Shut up. You it. You it. Yeah, shut up. Yeah, saying, it, yeah. And and, and, I'm, and I'm sitting there song. listening to it like it just kept going for a long time. Then it changed it. So it was a way too long before it went to the other part. And then that's when I found out I could produce. I shortened it and made it go happen faster. But really, that's what I did. He brought the whole entire song. So that's Tim. Mm. And um and then I wrote, you know. The verses, and then Dwayne wrote, Now it may be cold on the East Coast. And he didn't get no credit for it either, Dwayne. You ain't give no credit? No, nah, we give him no credit. But he didn't also give me no credit. He, we had wrote the song, Dwayne is Funny. Dwayne would just always block, hog the studio, not knowing. So we, we would try to write, and Dwayne just hog the studio. So we came there on a Sunday, and we wrote It Never Rains. And Dwayne came back on a Monday in the studio, walked in the studio like, <coughs> You little nigga try to do something, huh? Mm-hmm. He was like, What? But Dwayne is funny like that. So that's when we wrote, he said, you should put this on this part. Now it may be cold. And it was so good. We was looking at him like, Damn, even though you just dissed us last week, it do sound we, good. we're putting that on there. <laughs> and so he got me back on um, whatever you want. Whatever you want. Mm-hmm. So he wrote, him and Tim and Carl wrote it, but I wrote, girl, you know I can provide mm-hmm. whatever you need. Call 62-21-35. So we had a meeting and him and Tim came in a meeting and told me, yeah, you didn't write on uh, whatever you want. I'm like, but that's my phone number. <laughs> <laughs> Got motherfuckers calling me all the time tonight. I'm like, I wrote it. <laughs> but I said my phone number. That's my phone number. That's the first phone that I had. It's, it's, it's 15 years old. That's my mom funny. made me pay for my own phone. Yeah. That, that was, my phone number was 510, no, 415 at the time, 632-2135. I told you I was a, la- a lazy lyricist sometime. Right. So I just said, he was they, they, all they had was whatever you want. And I was like, girl, you know I can. And that's me singing it. I produced it. They never, ever gave me nothing to sing in life. On the, No Tony's album. That's funny. Nobody never told me what to sing. I'm saying what they I They watching this right now saying, he lying. Oh, they know, no, 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 no. Like, they know. But <laughs> but I. that's me singing about him. Just as sure as my name is Dwayne. Oh, Dwayne. Dwayne. What you thought he was saying? Tony. No. This whole time I thought he was saying just as sure as my name is Tony. That's Dwayne's favorite part. Except I, lo- that's I not love his to watch name. how Dwayne lights up. <laughs> When you say that, if you ever, <laughs> if you ever want to make Dwayne light up, all you got to say, just as sure as my name is Dwayne. He, he'll, he'll be like this already. Did y'all know, <laughs> all jokes aside, y'all know he was saying Dwayne? I did not. I thought he was saying Tony. No, just that's sure Dwayne. Tony. That's DWP. Dwayne Patrice Wiggins. Wow. So in doing? order to get that energy, y'all do have to be together. to get that, In order for us to get that, I, I mean, you can't go back in time, but to get that Tony, Tony, Tony energy, y'all have to be together, kind of. Nah, I saw my new album. The energy's there. The first single is no, but, no, but joke, you know, no, for for real though, yeah. Mm-hmm. The energy between uh, the three of us is, is magical. I know it. Like I, I could, I wouldn't be anything without my brother and <laughs> without my, um, and without without the guys. I mean, it was just, uh, it just made it comfortable. If you know, if you have these musicians behind you, that's really, really good. Mm-hmm. You know, you have this wall behind you. You could play better. You know, what I mean? you could play better. You can't tell me that if. When you watch stuff like the BET Awards and you see Mary rock out, get the Lifetime Achievement Award, you're like, damn, Tony, Tony, Tony will kill this crowd right now. So it's got to be a part of you that feels. Oh, like no, I man. Bit. Mary kind of stumped it. I was Mary, sitting oh, no, there. No, 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 no. Destroyed. I mean, come on. Mary you saying like, yeah, no, we, we, could, I, we could definitely do the same. We would definitely do yes. the same. But, yeah. I, this, I think that I've been to the BET Awards in like maybe like five years. And it was a, to watch Mary rock was was. It was, it was this feeling, man. You know, I got just just brought out in New York. See, but what I love the most when meth when meth came out. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I don't know. I'm I'm not really big on awards, man. Honestly, I'm not. Um, I like to get them so like fans could say, you know, they, you know, for them, you know, for me. And I know it would feel good getting it. I'm not gonna act like it when you that. Grammy Award winner. Yeah, I mean, I would. It feels good, but I've I've always talked about when I make music, like 
I mix music. I mix anniversary at the Hit Factory in New York, mm -hmm. and um, I was there till six in the morning. So it's a, it's a long version of uh, anniversary. This is long extended version of it. Um, I remember leaving the record plant like five in the morning. It was raining a little bit, and I knew I was like, this record is is it's crazy. You know, I, I knew it was crazy, and I just felt like. The more I listen to, I listen to it over, I, I want to say over a thousand times. To me, that's my reward. When I get, by the time you get my album, I've like marinated it in so much different flavors. Mm -hmm. When you get it, if you feel it, and I see you and you feel it, I'm gonna hit you like, uh. Cause I don't really know if you're gonna feel it, but Anniversary, those type of songs, I feel like, um, when I listen to them, those are my rewards. So Grammys, Oscars, any of that, I think they're great, you know, but. Honestly, at the end of the day, I mean, gold albums, like, what are they? I mean, I already got the the gold is here, bro. Like, right. So know. we can expect all this gold on Jimmy Lee. It's I'm excited there. for Jimmy Lee now. It's I feel like there. a Tony, Tony, Tony biopic would be fire. Yeah, it could. I feel like it's a lot we don't know. Or a Raphael Sadiq one, really. That whole journey. Oh, no, I still, the story is still going. I definitely want to mm -hmm. do something. It's a, lot of, it's a lot of stories that need to be told. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Y'all going on tour? As a, as a family? One day, I mean, but right now I'm definitely doing on tour with uh, the solo project. Um, I would love to bring the Tonys out. You definitely will see us to, see us together just for just for the culture. I want to do it, but this record, I mean, I think I'm I'm doing uh, Afro Punk in uh, Paris. Um, I'm doing the One Fest mm -hmm. in Atlanta. Um, it's just, it's just the beginning, you know. I know you never know what's going, but but I want everybody to really like. Even though I say this record, Jimmy Lee is about my brother. It's not a downer. It's like it's it's sort of like an uplifting record. And um, now you know you might be dancing and, and your two step and be like, damn, you know, and you hear something a little like, wow. But I'm I'm really uh, excited about the record. We appreciate you for joining us. Man. Nah, man, this has been a, a man, more thank than you, pleasure. Thank you, bro. And one of the best things that's gonna come out of this interview is Envy's about to do a Tony, Tony, Tony Raphael you know Sadiq mix <laughs> right you now know. on and this fine Friday. It. God yes. damn it! Yes. <laughs> All right. Well, Raphael Sadiq, we appreciate you for joining us. Death. It's the Breakfast Club. Good morning.